Thank you so much. <laughs> Hello, thank you and welcome. Uh, can everybody hear me okay even in the back? Great. Well, my name is June Ebersall. I oversee the Natural History Department at McWayne Science Center in Birmingham, where I get to be one of the lucky few people in the state that gets to play with fossils for a living. Uh, I say play because to me it's not work. It's just absolutely wonderful and to go out and collect these things. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that Alabama is number one out of all the 50 states in the U.S., number one for different species of fossils. I get to study these things for a living. So even though I study all periods of fossils from Alabama, uh, one of my main fields of interest, research interest, is what's called the Pleistocene, known more commonly to people as the Ice Age. So today's presentation is actually going to be on what Ice Age mammals used to live here in our own backyard in Alabama. Uh, throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me refer to this particular word up here called the Pleistocene, which is the geologic name for the Ice Age. So I don't really like using the name Ice Age for several reasons I'll talk about here in a minute. So before you can talk about the Ice Age, you have to talk about when was it? When was the Pleistocene? When were these animals living? Well, if you look at the history of life, or really the history of geologic time, you can divide it into three periods. The one in the middle there is the time of the dinosaurs. When people think of fossils, they think of dinosaurs. And yes, we have dinosaurs here in Alabama. Before that's what's called the Paleozoic. That is before the dinosaurs. Tons of the fossils, northern half of the state, north of Tuscaloosa on up, it's all going to be older than the dinosaurs. So don't call me from Huntsville saying you have dinosaurs. The rocks are too old. But also don't call me from South Alabama. The rocks are too young. Up here in the Cenozoic, it's after the dinosaurs. Center part in the Black Belt, that's our dinosaur belt. What I've been researching for the past, oh, probably 10 years or so are the Ice Age animals, which you can find all over the state. They're all up here in the Cenozoic, after the time of the dinosaurs. If you zoom into the Cenozoic, the Cenozoic is divided up into a whole bunch of these different epochs. What we're looking at is the very, very top one, which is right before the Holocene, which is modern times when humans were here. So a lot of these animals you're going to see today, we're living side by side with humans. If you, take, if you zoom in to the Pleistocene, the Ice Age, that is actually divided up into a whole bunch of different stages. This is why I don't like calling it the Ice Age, because it's actually Ice Ages. What these things are are different glacial and interglacial events, meaning the glaciers are here, the glaciers go away. The glaciers are here, the glaciers go away. Most of the Ice Age animals in Alabama come from the last glacial period, what we call the Wisconsin. We have good evidence of how far this glacier came down in Wisconsin. Uh, thus, it gets its name. Right now, we're actually in an interglacial. We still have ice on the planet, but that ice is receding. But before that was the uh, Sangmonian interglacial, where the glaciers left. But before that, they were back again, what's called the Illinoisan. In the pre-Illinoisan, there were as many as 11 to 14 other glacial events. So these glaciers are just coming and going. It's called transgressions and regressions of, of glaciers. So it is actually ice ages, but I also don't like calling it that because it's very misleading, especially when you start talking about Alabama. All right, so one of the main questions I always get when I give this talk is, were there glaciers in Alabama? The answer is no. This is why I don't like calling it the ice age. That very last. Uh, glacial expanse, what we call the Wisconsin. So the very last glacier that was on Earth covering North America, this is as far as it came down. It didn't get past southern Illinois, two states away from Alabama. We didn't get a glacier close to us. All the other 11 to 14 didn't come past central Ohio. So there were zero glaciers here in Alabama. All right, so if there were no glaciers, the other common question I get is, was it freezing cold in Alabama? Well, actually, no. If you want to know what it was like in the Ice Age, of Alabama, just walk outside. Here's a global temperature map from 18,000 years ago, so near the end of the Ice Age, and here it is today. If you look at Alabama here, northern Alabama, probably on average throughout the course of the year, 10 degrees cooler than today. Southern Alabama, 5 degrees cooler. Probably snowed a little bit more, maybe got a little bit of snow in south Alabama, maybe it stuck on the ground a little bit. For the most part, temperatures just like it was today. So. If we didn't have glaciers and it wasn't really cold, you know, what did Alabama look like? A lot of people think this. <laughs> I think just about everybody has seen this movie. And this is the common public perception of the Ice Age. You have these, weird, maybe not this strange, but we do have strange animals you know, running around on ice caps and so forth. We didn't have these glaciers here. Uh, instead, you know, North Alabama in the Highland Rim area probably looked a lot like this. 
You don't see any snow on the ground. You don't see any ice. You see animals everywhere. You see wooded forests and lots of caves, because we do rank number one in map caves in the US, right here in Alabama. If you start looking in the Black Belt and on down to the Gulf Coastal Plain, heading on down to uh, Gulf Shores and so forth, it probably looked like this. This is what I'd imagine if you were um, maybe standing right here in Montgomery and looking north, with the foothills of the Appalachians, um, open prairies with spotted woodland going around, and animals everywhere. The reason I chose these two particular images is uh, it, it, we have these different eco-regions in Alabama that had different Ice Age animals. I really like calling Alabama, uh, the, it's, it's really a melting pot. Um, because we did not have glaciers here, and it was warm just like today, and we have tens of thousands of miles of waterways, we supported so many different types of animals. The ones everybody thinks about are the extinct ones, those woolly mammoths and so forth. But what a lot of people don't realize is that not every Ice Age animal is extinct. In fact, Every animal that's living in Alabama today, except for the domestics and things like cats and cows and those things, we're still living in the Ice Age. It's the same squirrels, the same rabbits, the same raccoons, the deer, the bear, they were all here in the Ice Age. So if you want to see an Ice Age animal, just go outside. Look on the side of the road and you can see dead Ice Age animals. <laughs> what was also interesting about Alabama is that um, Today, you'll read in the literature that we rank number five in what's called biodiversity, which is the number, the number of different species of plants and animals. Well, the truth is we rank number one, we just haven't done the research. A lot of that has to do with our, position, our location, uh, proximity to the equator, and once again, the amount of waterways and so forth. But during the Ice Age, not only were those still animals still living here, we had the add-on, the extinct ones, but then you also have these strange migrants. With glaciers covering the northern half of the continent, water levels were so far down, we had these natural bridges that actually connected Alaska to uh, you know, northern Russia, Siberia, and so forth. So this became a highway for animals to come back and forth. So things like the mastodons and mammoths and uh, bison and so forth came over from the old world and started populating North America. Those we find right down here in Alabama, these things that traditionally would not be here. Well, the same thing happened, a lot of people don't realize, with South America. It's what's called the Great American Interchange. Once water levels were down, it exposed another land bridge down here, and all these strange South American animals that were in isolation for millions of years started coming on up into North America. This is where things, you know, where our sloths and armadillos and those types of things all started coming up from South America. The other thing that happened was there are lots of animals that don't like living on glaciers. So modern animals that are still living today that generally like colder climates, it was too cold for them. The glaciers pushed them down to Alabama. So it's a true melting pot where North America in particular is so unique where not only do we have old world animals, animals from South America, but Alabama in particular has all these northern animals that shouldn't be here. So in a minute I'll go through a lot of the animals that are here. A couple more just intro things. The reason I chose those two slides earlier of the Highland Rim and the Gulf Coastal Plain is those are the two main areas where we find Ice Age fossils in Alabama. The area I like working a lot in is the Highland Rim. Mostly these things are going to be uh, limited to caves. Uh, the caves are absolutely amazing. You walk in and you're walking on nothing but thousands and thousands and thousands of dead animals. I have a photo that I'll show you here in a minute. Um, the second region is the Gulf Coastal Plain, more specifically the Black Prairie region, also you know, referred to as the Black Belt. Uh, these rivers and streams, I've never been in a river and stream in Alabama where I've not come across Ice Age fossils. Now this is actually traditionally where the, this is where all the dinosaur stuff is, the dinosaur rage material is, but in those same creeks, you will find dinosaur rage, shark's teeth, and parts of mosasaurs and turtles, but then you'll come across you know, mastodon teeth, bison teeth, in the same gravel bars. So you have this big mix, what we call an unconformity, a big gap in missing in geologic time where things that are 10,000 years old are laying right on top of things that are 80 million years old. So it's a very interesting situation. There, um, but it's these chalks down here, uh, that little white chalky stuff with the chalky blowouts you find all over in the Black Belt, those things preserve fossils very well. That's why we find so many dinosaur age fossils, but they also preserve the Ice Age fossils which are deposited much later afterwards. You can also find them in these chalk gullies. These things really have no economic value. They're just blown out. You really can't grow anything in them. You really can't herd cattle in them, but they are unbelievably rich with fossils, not only dinosaur age, but ice age. All right, so what sort of stuff do we find? Other states, complete things like this, makes it easy to identify. So this is a you know, giant short-faced bear. 
It would be wonderful if we can find things like this in Alabama where you just dig it up and there it is, the whole thing, you put it in the museum. Unfortunately, not the case. Not a single complete Ice Age animal has ever been found in the state of Alabama. More of what we deal with is things like this. You're walking along a creek and you'll come across just one single worn bone. We can tell that, I can tell it is Ice Age because it's dark brown to almost black in color. The recent stuff would be more green or even look modern and be more cracked. But this is actually an ankle bone from an Ice Age deer. Same species of deer that's living today, the white-tailed deer. This is just a 10,000-year-old version. This is what we have to deal with. Other states, hey, you've got the whole thing, easy to identify. Well, we have to figure out what bone it is first, and we are lucky to get a complete bone, and then we've got to figure out what animal that bone came from. Now, when we rank you know, number one in biodiversity and had these animals from all other parts of the world and stuff from northern U.S., well, that's a big list to try to narrow down to figure out what these things are, so it's, it's, a, it's tall order. When you go into caves, this is a lot of time when you wash them on off, this is what you're walking on. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dead Ice Age animals. A lot of these caves were death traps, where they had natural openings sometimes in the Ice Age where animals would be coming in and denning. A lot of times they're sinkhole death traps. These animals are running along, there's a big crack in the earth and they fall in, where you go in these caves and you just find bone piles. Now, they're probably complete animals, oops, probably complete animals in here, but can never piece it together, these things are tiny. Here's the quarter here for scale. I mean, this is thousands and thousands and thousands of reptiles and amphibians, mammals, fish, and then you can find the big things in there as well, all the extinct animals and so forth. Oh. So a lot of what I do is I pick out individual bones that are fairly complete, like this one here, for example, and identify those, and I start building what are called systematic collections. It's basically a list of Ice Age animals that I was able to identify. Uh, this one here, this is a femur, I can tell from the ball and so forth, and from the size and the general shape, it's some type of squirrel, but I'll compare it to modern squirrels. Um, I am one of those strange guys that collects roadkill from the side of the road, because again, <laughs> nearly all the Ice Age animals are still living today. So I have direct ways that I can compare and figure out what these things are. A lot of the things are tiny, tiny. Um, I'm happy when we, I'm very happy when I can find complete bones. Uh, I'm very happy when I can find two bones that go to the same animal. Almost never happens, but this is a tiny section of another white-tailed deer. Just a fragment of the lower jaw here, and just happens to have two teeth. With the teeth there, I can identify it. Some of the things, it takes microscopes we can identify. This is a centimeter long, nearly complete bat jaw. Now, trying to identify bats just by looking at their tiny, tiny teeth under a microscope, difficult. Um, so a lot of these things, I'll send this to bat experts. I can say to the bat, hey, here's my bat jaws. Can you send me a list of what you find? All right, so what, were, what mammals do we know of that lived here in Alabama? I don't really care about ones from Georgia or ones from the western U.S. or anywhere else. I want to know what was living right here in our own backyard in Alabama. And very little is in the literature. You'll hear about finds in the newspaper and so forth. And even if you look at the, the book Fossil Vertebrates of Alabama, which is one of the more comprehensive books out there for fossils, uh, vertebrate fossils from the state, they maybe list 15 or 16 different, but we have, you know, we have records that are also here in the Ice Age. Oh, other little ones, you know, different species of squirrels and chipmunks and the deer mouse and the harvest mouse and the eastern gray squirrel and the muskrat, all still here. I actually came across dead one of these on the road coming in. All right. As for carnivores, these are a little more interesting. Um, same thing with you know, Virginia possums, coyotes, weasels, river otters, bobcats, fishers, martins, also here in the Ice Age. All right, uh, two different types of, of skunks. Hopefully you don't come across these uh, very often. Uh, but <laughs> the same raccoons, foxes, black bears, gray fox, all still living here in Alabama. And then the most common middle to large sized Ice Age animal that we find in caves or in the Gulf Coastal Plain are white-tailed deer. Very easy to identify, very solid bones in their legs and so forth, and their teeth are, are very diagnostic. So, um, very, very, very common. So just as they're very common in the state today, seem to have the same distribution and, and population size in the Ice Age. Now, the ones that are getting interesting, to, the, the ones that I try to research a little bit more are the extra, extirpated and the extinct ones. The extinct ones are the ones that you see in the movies. No one wants to have a movie with just you know, a little red squirrel and running around. That's not you know, really a star of a show there. People want to see the saber-toothed cats and so forth. The extirpated ones, though, are ones that really tell detailed stories of what's going on, um, how the environment has changed, even though our temperature didn't change very much. Why are these animals leaving? A good example here is Cervus canadiensis, known as the elk or the wapiti. These things were here 
uh, in the Ice Age, you know, they're actually very, very common. We can find them in, in sites all over the state. Um, but the ranges now, you know, you find them in the western U.S., and then you'll find them over here in the Old World. Uh, these ones actually didn't leave after the Ice Age. We have archaeological evidence that they were here as late as 2,500 years ago, so almost 8,000 years after the Ice Age ended. So this is a different story. Why are they no longer in Alabama? It had nothing really to do with the, the climate change and the glaciers uh, receding and so forth. So, you know, it, does it have to do with, with population? Did it have to do with plants changing in the region? Uh, so this is really, you know, one of, those, one of those mysteries. You know, were they overhunted? Right now we really don't have an answer for that. Um, this is the modern range for reindeer. Well, uh, we actually had reindeer down here, so Santa could have made a pit spot, a pit stop uh, back in the Ice Age where we actually have the southernmost record of reindeer ever recorded in the United States right here in Alabama in Colbert County. So it's one of those animals there that didn't like these glaciers up here, but still liked it cold, and it was just cold enough in northern Alabama for these guys to come on down. So that was their natural range. So very, very interesting situation there. But once again, once the glaciers left, they just left Alabama. Uh, we actually had three different types of bison. There's the modern bison over here. Uh, these were fairly common all across Alabama. Um, today, unfortunately, you know, they're, they're they almost went extinct. And it's actually Ted Turner uh, who brought back bison populations. There were only several thousand left before he really started his conservation efforts um, by building restaurants to eat them, but somehow it saved them. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they're they, they fairly common. Um, they were in Alabama until after the Ice Age ended. And then they left, but then they came back for a brief time in historic times. So when you see those big majestic pictures of Native Americans hunting bison, not here in Alabama. That's out west. Most of the herds moved out to the western United States. Here in Alabama, they were eating other things. But we had two different types of extinct bison here. Uh, one of them here, the bison antiquus, you can see on display a nearly complete skull of one of these um, at the University of Alabama's museum. And the difference is the body sizes were about the same, but what differentiates them is the width of the horn. So I think everybody's seen a regular bison. There's one on display here on the second floor. Uh, the span here is about four feet from tip to tip. When you look at the large, even larger bison latifrons, this is six to eight feet across. They were absolutely enormous bison. Uh, horses are a strange situation. This is the only one I've ever come across that's both extinct and extirpated, meaning no longer living on Earth, but at the same time, no longer living in Alabama. And the reason that it's both is during the Ice Age, there were as many as four different species of horses that once lived here. All of them are extinct. We didn't have our own. Today, we don't have natural populations. These were all introduced to Alabama. So we don't know the species yet, because we only find their teeth, and you can't tell them apart. You can't tell what species they are from these teeth. Um, but we know that just from the sizes of them, they're probably four, maybe there's a long-legged one, a short-legged one, a three-toed one, and so forth. Um, and so all those are extinct, but also they no longer the modern version is no longer the here. All right, when you start looking at other extirpated animals here, these ones are interesting to me, like this hairy-tailed mole. This is its modern distribution here, northeastern U.S. In Alabama, we find them in the northern half of the state. So I do have an explanation for this. If we have time, I'll show you at the end. Uh, same thing over here with the redback bull in the eastern half of the country. Once again, they're following the, basically the very, very tops of the Appalachians. It's a few degrees cooler. They like that. Uh, these guys almost come into Alabama, but they're really not technically here. Uh, same thing here with, with the rock bulls. But during the Ice Age, once again, these northern glaciers pushed them down. And so they're fairly common in, in cave deposits in North Alabama. All right, other extirpated ones, the 13 line ground squirrel. This is one where, yes, they were in the northern half of Alabama, but now they're basically gone from the southeastern United States. This to me, and, and really from the east coast as well, um, this more to me has to do with, with population pressures, us destroying their habitats, pushing them out west to less populated areas. Um, this right here, though, seems, you know, with the bog lemmings, yes, they were pushed down to Alabama. They like it slightly colder. Once the glaciers went back up, they went back north as well. Same thing with the northern bog lemming. All right, big cats. Okay, the mountain lions. Um, yes, we had them here in Alabama. We had them here in historic times as well. But once again, population growth has pushed them out west. Saber-toothed cat, yes, we did have those here. We don't know the exact species. We do know, though, it's in the genus Smilodon. Uh, we only know it from one single tooth that came out of a cave in Colbert County, but it just happened to be the right tooth to tell me that it's saber-toothed cat, and it was the big, gigantic canine here. Um, then we do have the Pleistocene North American jaguar. The North American jaguar is still living today, but this is a subspecies called Panthera onca augusta. 
It's very closely related, genetically probably very, very close. The only difference was the Ice Age version was about 30% larger than the modern version. So uh, it basically has the same name, just a subspecies because of its size. All right, other ones that are extirpated that are interesting are the ermine, um, the, the woodland jumping mouse. We have the only Ice Age record from the southeastern U.S. of these right here in Alabama. And then the porcupine. Now, the porcupine's another interesting one. We had porcupines in Alabama up until 500 years ago. So it's one that was once again unaffected by the glaciers leaving. But, you know, if you look again where all the people are living, uh, it's habitat destruction moved them up north and out west. All right. Two different types of wolf that we were able to identify. One is the red wolf, the Canis lupus rufus, and you can see their modern distributions today. Uh, unfortunately, this is 100% with habitat destruction. Um, pretty soon I'll have to change this to green. These guys are almost extinct. Genetically pure red wolves, I would say, you know, there's less than 100. Most of them are going to be in zoos. All the other ones have done interbreeding breeding with um, other wolves, coyotes, and so forth. So genetically pure red wolves, uh, you're not going to see them in the wild in just a few years. Uh, that would be my guess. Um, but we did have what's called the dire wolf, which is fairly common here in Alabama, one of the largest wolves that ever lived. If you take the large gray wolf, which is the largest living wolf in North America, these guys were probably 30% larger. So huge, huge pack hunters. Other extinct ones. We've got our modern beavers, but we also had giant beavers. These are five foot long giant beavers. Um, if you look at a modern beaver too, uh, the, the front canines, the tree chewing teeth, um, or the, the front incisors, uh, they're maybe two inches long and, and curved. Uh, these ones, for the giant beavers, the castorites are eight to nine inches long. I mean, they were absolutely enormous. We don't know if they built dams or not. We don't know if they had these big flat tails, but they are almost identical to, to beavers where they're, they're definitely related. Uh, we have living here, we have two that have been discovered in a cave in Jackson County of Arctotus. Arctotus is one of the largest bears that ever lived. If this guy stood up, he's going to be about 13 feet tall, which is larger than the modern Kodiak. They're giant short-faced bears, so they really have this flat face here. Unbelievably huge bears that you wouldn't want to come across. Other extinct ones, these are some of the South American guys that came over here. So peccaries. There are modern versions of peccaries that live in South America. These are two extinct ones that we find. But what's interesting is this one called Milo Hyas, we find them in the caves. They preferred the woodlands. Down in the prairies, down in the uh, Gulf Coastal Plain in the Black Belt, we find platyginous. They seem to be more grazers. We really don't find them mixed. When you find these ones, you don't find these. When you find these, you don't find these. But their teeth are completely different, so we can really tell them apart pretty easily. But then we also had tapers. So there are modern tapers. This is just the extinct Ice Age version. Another one of those things that just migrated north from South America and ended up living here in Alabama. All right, so as we had you know, regular armadillos today, we had two different species of giant armadillos. The first one is called Dazzy Pisbelis. Very, very common in nearly all Ice Age sites that we find. And what we find is the armored plating, what are called the scoots. If you look at modern armadillos, these little scoots can kind of break apart when you find them when they're rotten on the side of the road. And each one of these little rectangles here, they're about the size of a racer heads. Dazzy Pisbelis, each one of these little things, about the size of oyster crackers. So they're significantly bigger. So these are possibly three, maybe four foot long armadillos. The pampathiers got enormous. Each one of these little scoots here, the size of Ritz crackers. These things got enormous. I mean, you could, you could put your kids on these and ride them, maybe two or three kids at a time. And they, they're absolutely huge. <laughs> All right, mastodons and mammoths, two of the most common um, recognizable Ice Age animals. A lot of people don't know the difference, however. Yes, they were both fuzzy relatives of elephants. Woolly mammoths got slightly larger. A lot of times they had these big bumps on their heads and so forth, much longer and curved tusks. Mastodons, slightly shorter tusks, not as curved, not as large. Still huge, still larger than modern elephants, just not as big as these enormous mammoths. Generally in states you're going to find one or the other, mostly because it's habitat preference. The woolly mammoths here, uh, they're more grazers. When you look at their teeth, they look like the bottom of your sneaker. They have these little parallel ridges just like modern elephants do. Those are actually growth rings. So when you find a mammoth tooth and it looks like a sneaker, you can count those things and figure out actually how old your woolly mammoth is. Mastodons, they, uh, their, their teeth look more like the Smoky Mountains, like little mountain tops. They're more woodland browsers. So they're crunching up sticks and leaves and so forth. They have different shaped grinding teeth. So the, Mastodons, uh, 
you can find them really all over the state. You can find them in the Gulf Coastal Plain because we had spotty forest um, all throughout there, you know, going all the way down to the coast. And then, and then common, you know, I, this by far, it, probably several hundred of these have been found in the state. I can only, searching through the literature, looking through museum collections, only three mammoths have been found. So if you find giant, giant elephant bones and elephant teeth, most of them are going to be mastodon, much more common than the woolly mammoth. Woolly mammoth had a very restricted range in Alabama. Nearly all of them are found right in the black belt where we had more open prairie than anywhere else. All right, we had llamas and camels here. Uh, very strange to think. Uh, <laughs> we had two different types of these llamas. One's called the stout-legged llama, called the paleo llama. Now, I should say that every single animal that I showed you thus far, we have what are called voucher specimens meaning that I'll show you a nice little you know, artist rendering of them up here, but you can actually go to a museum. Most of them, are 90% are actually at McWayne Science Center or University of Alabama, and you can see the actual bones, the actual evidence. Uh, Paleo llama I know is here because we find them in Georgia, we find them in Tennessee, we have them in Florida, and then we have them in Mississippi. Now, uh, unless they're LSU and Arkansas fans, you know, they're, they're not avoiding Alabama. They were here. <laughs> Uh, the other one is Hemiakenia. They're just much larger uh, llamas. Uh, and so these, we only have a couple records of them in the state, but there should be many. Uh, most of these you're going to find down in the Black Prairie. These are really not you know, cave animals. My favorite animals out there uh, that we find here are the giant ground sloths. So, so far we've identified two different species of these things. So in the Ice Age, well, so the sloth is actually based on a real animal um, that, that we find you know, quite a few of here in Alabama. Um, but these things were huge. This is the smaller one here called Paramylodon, and you can see its upper arm bones. They have four of them on display, or three of them on display at University of Alabama. Uh, their upper arm bones are you know, maybe three, three and a half feet long. If this guy stood up, kind of like this guy is, he would be seven to eight feet tall. The larger ones that we have, a, probably an 80% complete one at McLean Science Center is this, what's called Jefferson's ground sloth. Um, some of the earliest bones uh, from this particular animal were looked at by Thomas Jefferson, so the animal was named after him. Uh, these guys, when they stood up, eight to nine feet tall. Um, they did have big googly eyes, but huge hands the size of dinner plates, huge you know, six to seven inch claws on each hand. Uh, very, very interesting animals. Um, generally, museums will see them mounted like this because it's more impressive, but they did more walk like gorillas. They walked on the backs of their palms, but they did turn their feet in, but this is mostly to, collect, uh, to protect those large large claws. All right, so with that, I'm going to end here. I have a couple more slides at the end. If we have time, we'll talk about those. Um, but I'm just going to stick around and answer any questions that people have, and also stay around afterwards if people have additional questions about Ice Age stuff and other fossils. But thank you very much. <laughs> Please raise your hand and we will give you a microphone. We do have an overflow auditorium and we want the people in the auditorium to be able to hear your question. And I have two on the back row. How, how big were those extinct uh, horses that were in Alabama? We don't know because we only find their teeth. Um, a lot of the early horses were very, very, very small. Um, some that, you know, smaller than dogs and so forth. Um, here we can't tell. Most of the teeth were roughly the same size. Uh, we, we can't really, their size differences are so, uh, so similar, we, we have a hard time telling. So, uh, uh, other states find more complete ones. Uh, Florida probably has one of the most complete records of the different Pleistocene horses. I just need to go down and study those more to see which ones would have been further up north to here. Would the llamas come up from the south? Yes, those all came from South America during that Great American Interchange. Okay. <laughs> Do you think they were as slow as modern uh, they, <laughs> It's a common question I get from the kids. Um, they, they, they actually are not really related to the modern sloths, but when you look at all the, basically, the animal morphology or all the different shapes of all the animals, the bones most closely resemble the modern tree sloths, but the giant ground sloths never lived in trees. These are two and a half ton animals. I don't think there's a tree out there that'll hold that up. But <laughs> Um, but they're really unlike any living animal. They really have no modern relative, and the shapes of the bones are completely different. But if you had to put it close to something that's living today, you would put it near the tree sloth, but it's completely different, completely different family. Uh, do you ever have a, uh, a dinner table of uh, that actually seems to be every day. 
all the time people will, every day people will send me uh, images, email me stuff, or bring stuff into the office to look at. So. Oh, not at all. It's part of what I do. I'm curious to see what people are finding out there. Um, I don't have time to get out every day myself. So. Um. Okay, I have one more question. Do, do you just focus on the uh, mammals, or do you are you interested in the plants and things we're finding? You must have come to my lab. <laughs> <laughs> um, I try to reconstruct the ancient ecosystem, so I try to look at everything. My favorite is the mammals, um, but I'll also look at the reptiles, amphibians, and so forth. But it just so happened last summer when I was down in Greene County, Alabama, came across a huge deposit of perfectly preserved Ice Age leaves. Now, it's very interesting to me that these, uh, these things, if, if I let them just dry on a table, they, shrivel, they just shrivel up into powder. But I found a way to dry them and press them and preserve them in slides where I can actually identify them. And so, as where all these plants are probably still living here in Alabama today, the ranges changed, just like a lot of the animals did. Uh, one of the earliest plants that I identified down there was a, a, a pin oak. Pin oaks, their natural distribution today is on the Alabama-Tennessee border. But during the Ice Age, once again, those glaciers pushed certain plants down, and this is one of them. We're finding them in Greene County in central Alabama. So yes, the trees were moving around as well. If we have time, I'll show you another slide that shows we had a complete plant changeover, which helped lead into the extinction of large, a lot of the larger animals. Oh. Well, a warm-blooded or cold-blooded animal? It's a mammal, so they're warm-blooded. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. You mentioned finding uh, artifacts in caves and stream beds and white chalk areas. Are there other areas that are productive, or where would uh, we happen to see something like that if we happen to be out looking around and stuff? Uh, the easiest place to find them is along stream beds. Um, the black belt, they're just preserved better, but they've been found in just about every, every county except for the Piedmont area, but that's because no one has looked. So that's Florida, Sylacauga, and, and so forth near Auburn. Um, they were basically living on the same soil that we were living on. So now it's just a matter of if there's a city there, you're not going to find any in downtown Birmingham. They're paved over. Um, but there's reports, even go, you know, going back to the uh, 1930s and 1940s, of you know, half a Macedon being found in bridge projects you know, in North Jefferson County. We definitely find them in large concentrations in caves, once again, because of the preservation. It's very dry there. You don't have the flesh-eating bacteria. Just preserved bones like they died yesterday. A lot of these things aren't even completely fossilized yet, which is amazing. Some of the younger ones, we can actually get DNA out of them, not intact DNA where we can clone them like Jurassic Park, but enough that it actually can pinpoint uh, how we can identify these things are that well preserved. But then the black belt, we find them all over. Uh, there are even reports going back to the 1800s of stuff being discovered uh, down in the uh, Gulf Coast and so forth, but every, every part of the state. But rivers and streams, that's your place to be. Uh, I was just wondering about spear points and arrow points. Uh, you're finding the fossils. Uh, how often do you find those two together where there's evidence of hunters? Everywhere in Alabama. Um, <laughs> Alabama, we rank number one in miles of freshwater waterways. The food here, we are number one. Don't let anybody else ever tell you different. We are number one in different species of freshwater fish, freshwater mussels, freshwater snails, reptiles, amphibians, all because of these aquatic ecosystems. So much food here, it was warm. Yes, the Native Americans were here all over the state up until you know, even historic times. Um, you can find different periods of stuff, basically all the periods of the Native Americans in North America, the Paleo-Indian, the Archaic, the Woodland, the Mississippi, and you can find here in Alabama, all over the place. So Paleo-Indian points, these are the people that were living with these extinct animals, hunting the woolly mammoths and the, the large extinct bison and so forth. You can find them all over the state, from South Alabama to North Alabama. When you are out in the Black Belt, for example, the bottom of the creek is going to be dinosaur aged. But as I was explaining to a gentleman earlier, there is a very distinct blue layer, almost as blue as this gentleman's shirt here, which is the Ice Age layer. So you can sometimes see Ice Age bones coming out of that. Most times they just get washed up in the gravel bars. But above that are the human occupation layers or archaeological layers. So generally you'll find pot sherds higher up in the bank, Native American points, and that blue layer with your Ice Age stuff, and then below that dinosaur age stuff. Why do you think only horse teeth have been found and no horse bones? You know, it, it's, it's a very good question. I don't really have an answer to that. A lot of it is because other bones in the body are just hard to identify. So it's what we call an identification bias. The teeth, if you've ever seen a horse tooth, they're long and you look at them at the chewing surface, they're almost perfectly square. Easy to identify, we, can, we know that they're horse. 
Um, other bones in the body, not as easy to identify. If I found a rib from a horse, bruh, how can I tell that apart from you know, some of the other large animals living at the time? Um, but, but a lot of it as well is that you're not going to find the horses in the caves, so you don't really have that good preservation up there. I've only seen one photograph, and actually have not seen the specimen, of someone who was in a cave in North Alabama, and they showed me a picture of what seemed to be a horse hoof. So I need to go, and it's about in a 200-foot drop down in one of these caves, so I need to learn how to repel to go see it, because if I can find other bones outside of the teeth, more skull stuff, if this actually fell in one of those sinkhole traps, yes, I can identify and you know, figure out how big our horses are and so forth. Um, but most of it's going to be found in the Gulf Coastal Plain, Black Belt and so forth, where you only find individual bones. Um, think of it as a, kind of like a washing machine where it just blends everything up. A lot of the bones get just trampled, disintegrated, broken, where you can't identify them, but the teeth are huge, solid, hardest thing in the body. They tend to preserve a whole lot better. Hmm. I noticed that you didn't have any Birds. Ah, yes. Um, birds, we, we have a whole great record of them in Alabama. So there are over, what, 460 different species you can find throughout the year in Alabama today. All of those would have been here, as well as more uh, northern species and so forth. And part of a longer presentation, I have the reptiles, amphibians, and birds. We have 40-something birds identified from the state now, but all from one study. All those came out of one cave. Um, and so birds will be something I'll be diving into before too long, but boy, they are difficult to identify. I may be able to tell you it's a duck leg bone, but there's so many different species of ducks. How do you tell them apart when you don't have the feathers and don't have the flesh? Um, so it's one of those things that's extremely, extremely difficult. You need extremely well-preserved material, um, but that list should be up there in the hundreds. Um, in North Alabama, we have over 500 map caves. We've looked for Ice Age stuff, and maybe eight of them. So I've got a lot of work to do in those, and that's where a lot of the birds will be uh, much better preserved. You can find them in the Gulf Coastal Plain, but they're going to be too worn and broken to identify. So it's just going to be more cave work to flush out that list. Yeah. Okay, well, let's get back to the leaves. Mm -hmm. As, as the age leaves, yes. uh, you said that you had figured out a way to keep them from disintegrating. When you found them, where were they? Uh, how were they preserved from the Ice Age? And what did they look like? All right. Um, last question is the easiest one to answer. What did they look like? They look like leaves that you can find outside today. If you've ever been walking through a stream and you're walking along and then it starts smelling like methane because you're walking on leaf beds that are decomposing, they're black like that. I discovered these down in Greene County where I'm following a particular creek and I'm following that blue layer that I was talking about. And so the layer is not, you know, you'll find a spot over here, then a spot over here. So I'm tracing it down about a quarter mile, but coming out of that blue layer was just compact leaves, just a whole layer of nothing but solid leaves. And so I brought back about a baseball-sized sample. I just pulled it right out of the bank uh, and started experimenting to see how I can preserve these things. Um, they were reported in the literature from Alabama in 1906 and 1910, and then the USGS was here in the 1990s and discovered some other ones. Um, but there's only three different papers that have ever been written on them. No, they came across individual ones out of this same Ice Age layer, but this is the first time I'm sure in history that people have come across a huge, is almost like a big old just mound coming out of this particular blue layer. Um, so my current research is getting radiocarbon dates from that to figure out how old they are, but how we were able to preserve them was, um, I don't work much with plants, and so I was calling some of the plant experts in the state to, how do you preserve your modern ones? And yes, there are chemicals and things that you can soak them in, but I didn't want to use any of those preservatives because we could potentially get DNA out of these things as well. And uh, what we found is that they just said, get a leaf press. When I leave them on the table and they start to curl, just by touching them is when they start falling apart and cracking. But when you press them and dry them, then carefully take tweezers, and then I actually purchased archival baseball card plastic slides where you can slide it in there and actually traps them and preserves them as an archival. And it just preserves them perfect, and it creates basically a slide for me that I can look at and see the venation and the leaf and the serrations on the side, and I do these things. Did you know they were ice age leaves? Only because they're coming out of that layer. And uh, until my radiocarbon dates come back, uh, they're probably going to be, this ice age layer in that particular area has been dated before between eight and 14,000 years old right the transition between the Ice Age and modern times. Uh, so this particular, my dates will confirm that, but finding leaves that shouldn't be there, like these pin oaks and so forth, is telling me that yes, they are certainly Ice Age. That brought up, <coughs> excuse me, that brought up another question in preservation, 
and that is I have found petrified wood that is pretty petrified. Oh. You know, it's that, car I think they call it the carbon stage or something. Sure, carbonized wood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I tried to preserve it by spraying shellac on it. That didn't do any good, and it's continuing to fall apart, and I would like to save it. Uh, generally, that carbonized wood is found in a wet environment. Um, once you start removing that moisture, yes, these things will start drying out internally and cracking and falling apart. Um, for those types of things, since they're not completely fossilized yet, we keep them suspended in solutions. Um, you can buy little cords just out of Carolina Biological Supply of what's called peg wax. It's polyethylene glycol. And it's used a lot to actually preserve you know, wooden shipwrecks and so forth, where it's a wax that replaces the water and it keeps the structure of the wood. Um, you can just get you know a little you know liter of that and just keep it in. Depending on how big your sample is, just Tupperware container, just soak it in that and it preserves it. Oh, it's that big? You'll have to get several liters, but that, that would be the way to do it. <laughs> there are other preservatives that you can use. Um, in the fossil world, we use stuff that's uh, called Bootvar. It's a, the chemical name is B76. It was originally developed by the the military for gluing panes of windshields together, but it's archival where. It uses what's called a penetrant. It comes out as a powder, but you mix it with acetone. And that acetone is great because it actually absorbs into the pores of even you know, fossils and teeth and so forth, then to coat things. And so it penetrates, it stabilizes, but it creates a moisture barrier. And so moisture that's trapped in there can't get out, and then other moisture can't get in. So. Do we have another question? You have about 10 minutes if you have some more slides. Oh, OK. Question. I can get through these quickly. One of the most common questions that I get is, Hey, what caused the late, late Pleistocene extinctions? There's a lot of theories out there. You'll see a lot of strange things that I call conspiracy theories on television about this. A uh, very common one is uh, overhunted by man. All right, so we have in North America 40 some odd, maybe 44 different species of these megafauna, these big mastodons, mammoths, ground sloths that went extinct right at the end of the Ice Age, but it just so happened to be the same time that we have Native Americans coming over that land bridge. Yes, the early Native Americans, the Paleo-Indians, were hunting these. But could they hunt 44 species to extinction? And this is a global extinction event as well. And so they all just you know, use their cell phones and you know, page each other and say, hey, let's just hunt these animals, but not the little ones. For selective extinction, very, very strange for overhunting. Yes, it happened. Maybe contributed in small parts in certain areas. But for a global thing and a North American extinction, it just doesn't add up in my mind. Um, the other one is disease. We are mixing populations of animals, North America, South America, North America to uh, you know, the old world, and even northern North America to southern North America. Yes, disease was there, but, is the, but why would the disease only target the 44 largest things? What about the small things? You would think those would have gone extinct as well, but they're all still here. So yeah, you know, these two things happen, but to me, it's not the overall cause for this extinction. Okay, extraterrestrial impact. We do know that 65 million years ago, that extra uh, asteroid hit the Earth, you know, killed off the dinosaurs. Well, people were giggling. This actually did happen. Um, <laughs> in Canada, there's actually an impact crater. And the reason we know the date for the death of the dinosaurs is uh, there's a particular substance you can only find deep in the Earth, but then also comes from outer space, meteorites, and so forth. It's called iridium. It's a radioactive substance that you can actually date. But well, we actually find this iridium in Ice Age layers that date to near the end of the Ice Age. But once again, what if it caused a global extinction of just the larger? It probably had a local event that killed off a lot of animals, northern North America and so forth, maybe did some population pressure things, but not enough for, for a global event. But it did actually happen here in North America, which is very interesting. Um, the other one is climate change. This is the one to me that is the only one that can explain what happened to these large animals. And here's what I'm talking about. Okay, it goes into the leaves as well. If you look at the eastern United States 18,000 years ago, you can start looking at different plant populations. At Ice Age sites all across the eastern U.S., we can find pollen, there are leaves trapped in caves and those types of things, and we can figure out what types of plants were living. These studies have been going on for 30, 40 years, enough for us to piece together maps like this. All right, so Alabama right here, the southern half is all deciduous. These are the plants that lose their leaves. Gets to, you know, in the wintertime, it gets cold, they lose their leaves. Okay, the boreal are the ones that don't lose their leaves. They'll keep whatever they have on them, things like uh, uh, pine trees and so forth. They'll, they'll keep those year round. Then you have the tundra. Um, this is uh, just kind of the, the scrappy small bushes and things that you'll see on television. But then you have the ice sheet up here where there's, you, know, you don't have these extensive forests and so forth. Uh, fast forward to about 10,000 years ago, deciduous plants. As the world is warming up, ice sheets are you know, um, going up north. Deciduous is taking over almost the entire um, southeastern U.S. 
Complete changeover right over here on the top of the Appalachians, basically from tundra to boreal. This is actually why some of those animals, those ones that like just a few degrees cooler, we can find here in Alabama, they're on the rooftop of the Appalachians, these boreal, we would call them boreal affinities, things that like slightly colder, these particular types of trees, those are little, you know, about 8,000 years where, yeah, you know, it's swapped over to boreal, and that's why they're hanging out here in Alabama right at the end of the Ice Age. Tundra moved way up here. This is actually what happened to our things like our, our uh, reindeer and so forth. They like this tundra land. Yes, they were down here in Alabama when this was tundra. Now they're only up here. Well, look at today, entire eastern U.S., deciduous. Very little boreal up here. And then tundra, you see this one little spot here, the boreal? We have a uh, standing population of hemlocks left over from the Ice Age. Those are some of these boreal plants. So in my mind, this is the only thing that can cause an extinction event of the largest things. So think about it. A lot of these large herbivores, let's take the mastodons and mammoths and ground sloths, if they're used to eating boreal plants or certain deciduous plants, but then all of a sudden, in just you know, 8,000 years, the food source completely flips over, they can't adapt quickly enough. It's something like a little uh, a squirrel that you know, can eat an acorn and be fine for a week. Well, you know, something like a woolly mammoth, what, how, how many pounds of food does it need to eat every single day? But if your food source is suddenly gone, what's well, gonna have too much population pressure? It's these things with these large caloric diets that have to eat so much, they can't adapt quickly enough. That's what seems to happen. Then you kill off those large herbivores, the larger carnivores are gonna go with it. So to me, that's the only explanation on uh, why I could selectively pick off the things that have to eat so much. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Amazon will be here for a few minutes if you would like to talk with him if you have uh, questions or if you have fossils that he needs to look at. Thank you so much for coming today. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>